So, Rory Brimner, why have I been invited to a church hall in <laughs> South London? Church hall in South London. Well, it's not dance, I can tell you that. We're not, uh, we're not rehearsing dance. They've got a couple of days uh, for Scottish opera to rehearse this production of Orpheus in the Underworld. It's the Offenbach uh, operetta. It's written in the 1860s. And they've taken it around Scotland on tour. It's been to amazing. It's been to Sky, to the Shetlands, to Dumfries, all around Scotland as part of their kind of outreach programme that Scottish Opera do. And they've been given eight or nine performances in London at the Young Vic. like I said, French Gilbert and Sullivan, but it had topical references when it was written in the 1860s, and so you can update it and have fun with it. It was a kind of satire on two levels. It, on, the, on one level, it was sending up Greek mythology and the whole Orpheus myth, but they were also sending up the Second Empire, Napoleon III, and he was kind of the Berlusconi of his day. Now, a lot of that is lost to a modern audience, and our preoccupations are obviously the banks and authority, generally. And I've changed a couple of things, like instead of being a shepherd, in Arcadia, which is what the original was. Arcadia to us now is kind of a store group run by Philip Green. Um, so he's now become a personal trainer. This is uh, the, the god of the underworld disguises himself as a personal trainer. And the bees of the original are his yummy mummy through his exercise class. The thing with TV, I guess, is that it gives you fame, but at the same time, it sort of puts you in quite a narrow definition as well. Do you think that this is an example of trying to break out of the kind of impressions people might have off you? You're in a kind of very lucky position of being able to um, say yes or say no to all sorts of different projects and I kind of again I like the I like the freedom and I like the um, the opportunity to take on different challenges. What happened to the Channel 4 series? It just came to an end. In television terms we were incredibly lucky to have the length of time that we did to do the programme. The thing about that kind of programme was that satire it needs the space to develop an argument. I mean I, the, the, the brilliant satirical work that I always sort of go back to is, uh, is Candide by Voltaire. So over the course of a whole novel, he just demolishes the, the prevalent idea of the time, was, which was this philosophy of optimism that everything was for the best in the best of all possible worlds and, and that it was preordained and that, that God knew what he was doing. And Voltaire took one look at the Lisbon earthquake and the, the chaos and, the, and the, the lives that were lost and said, this is, how can you possibly believe this? But he had the space in a novel to destroy the argument. Similarly, Bird and Fortune in, had six or seven or eight minutes, which is a long time in television, to undermine and to destroy arguments. It's unlikely we would get the space to do that ever again. But in terms of the tactics that one uses in terms of what the armoury that satire has, yeah. what do you think of things like The Daily Show or The Ten, or ten O'Clock Live, etc., which are, I guess, they're trying to sort of comment and reflect what's happening now in their own kind of ways. Got nothing against it. I think The Daily Show is a very good format, but I think you've got television channels who are chasing younger audiences and therefore trying to do things more and more quickly. You've got budgets which are being screwed down all the time. So you can't afford to, to, to back it up with research. And you have a public that is getting used to programmes which are either sensational or kind of quite superficial in terms of what subjects you can go into. All of those three things kind of legislate against doing a kind of satire in a traditional way. And even the word satire, what we do is really topical comedy more than satire because satire is dark and it's uncomfortable. And sometimes the more satirical shows that we did, people said, oh, that's very bitter. But it wasn't bitter, it was just dark and angry. It's interesting you mentioned about anger because I was just watching um, Charlie Brooker's new series yeah. and there's a certain savageness yeah. to that kind of writing and yeah. there's a certain anger as well. Mm. But I'm wondering because in your time when you were doing things, um, it was savage and it was angry but I wouldn't say it was offensive and I was wondering whether you think, do you think the television, the kind of the currency of TV necessitates being more and more offensive because the audience has become more numb to just the subtle points? Because there are more channels, perhaps they feel that individual channels have to sort of just scream louder in order to be heard and, and draw attention to themselves and you find this in terms of publicity as well when you work with PR people they're, they're much keener to do stunts or something which um, is shocking or outrageous to draw people's attention and I think because it's a very crowded marketplace that the need is to do something faster, sharper, more outrageous um, and I think it's difficult to be subtle in that, in that marketplace if you look at it like that but yet 
The best example of satire recently was um, Chris Morris doing Four Lions. Uh, but then, I mean, the, the brilliance of doing a, a satire on the suicide bombers. Chris found a way of doing it which actually had you sympathising with the characters who you just felt these were just characters like you or me who just happened to, to be very gullible and misguided and stupid. It's coming from one sensibility rather than a team of people, yeah. which The Daily Show is much more about, I guess, is that sense. You got to, you did, I think satire needs to have a point of view. I mean, otherwise it does, does become sort of soundbite satire. I mean, a little bit like, you know, have I got news for you or mock the week or whatever. It's got so many different viewpoints. And also, I mean, I've worked on the shows before where you have a lot of writers where you know they can give you six jokes uh, from a left-wing perspective and six jokes from a right-wing perspective. They tend to come more from a left-wing perspective because that's the, ten the satire we tend to have. You know, you think, well, where's, where is the voice? Where is the point of view? And I think increasingly with Burn and Fortune, we trusted our own instincts and we were putting our own point of view across, which I think, but not in a, not in a kind of um, editorialising way. You would just sort of say, look, you would just look at, uh, say, Iraq or the banking crisis and you would just say, this is crazy. And you then have to take a lot of time making sense of it and then make nonsense of it. And then you'd hold, up, hold that image up to the public and say, this is what we make of it. Do you agree or disagree? In terms of yourself, all the satire that you've done, all the political jokes you've done, do you think it's made a difference or has it <laughs> predominantly uh, been to entertain and make no, people laugh? I don't laugh? think you're going to make claims. Well, it was, it was both. Peter Cook always used to say about you know, the satire in Germany in the 1930s and how much it did to stop the rise of Hitler. So I think there are limits to what you can do um, for all sorts of reasons. What do you think people's expectations are to come here and what do you think they'll actually be getting? The funny thing about opera is that people think it's, if it's, uh, it's high art and, and all the rest of it, but yet when anyone wants to advertise a, a football tournament or a car or an advertise, do a sort of advertising campaign, they, they kind of they raid the, the opera cannon. This isn't opera, it's operetta. It's more like Gilbert and Sullivan. It's light opera. Um, it's kind of got that satirical um, edge to it. Um, but it's actually a romp. It's just, it's not, it has no great satirical pretensions. It, it, it has references, it has topical references. But I mean, the Can Can came from this in 1860. It was called The Gallop from Hell. And it was just a bit of a riot, a bit of a romp, and something which was crowd pleasing. Can you be crowd pleasing and satirical at the same time? I think um, it just gives people a license to enjoy the references to the world around them.